Hello, and welcome to the fifth in our series of Episcopal Women's History Project Lenten offerings. We're glad you're here with us, and uh, I hope that this will be as fulfilling to you as it, all of these have been for me. I want to let you know that we are the Episcopal Women's History Project. I am the president and uh, what we do and what is it most important for us is to tell stories, to read and, and, and record and just tell women's stories of women who, some who are important that we all know and others who um, haven't been so important, at least because they aren't well known. But we want to uh, keep those stories and tell those stories. If you're interested in this, at the end of this, I would ask you to go to our website, ewip.org, and, and uh, uh, look and see all, all about us. And, and if you choose, join us. Be part of our um, be part of our mission. We'd love to have you. We want to start with the women's prayer, prayer that was created and written by uh, Joanna Gillespie, who was one of the founders in 1980 of this organization. Charlie, you got it? There we go. O oh God, creator of all life, bless the unsung lives of countless Christian women in every century who were your hands and feet, who kept alive your compassionate presence by feeding the hungry, nursing the sick, clothing the naked, comforting the sad, praying and petitioning, strengthening those in prison, teaching the stories, sewing and singing, weeping and rejoicing. Grant us the wisdom to discern our ministries in this day as our foremothers found theirs. Lead us in new and timeless forms of discipleship and let us joyfully find our place in the procession of praise, offering our varied gifts and voices together with them and Mary, the mother of our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today, it is my honor to welcome Joe Weatherwilt Behrens, who is a writer and a history instructor. The history department dual enrollment coordinator and archivist at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And she's going to tell us the story of Elizabeth Pittman, the first woman judge and the first black judge in Nebraska. So I will turn this over to you, Joe, and I look forward to hearing all about her. Well, thank you. Um, so I in, have enjoyed working on this too. I just want a couple little caveats before we start. Um, that this is, while this is uh, a, an especially Nebraska story, um, I think some of the um, community aspects of it and some of the Black community aspects are applicable to cities of any of any size um, across the nation. But um, Elizabeth Davis Pittman is um, was a uh, an, a mid nineteen a mid twentieth century African American Black woman who um, thumbed her nose, whose community thumbed their nose at Jim Crow, who found um, success in what she wanted to do. Um, on, on the one hand, but her, her su success and her um, education failed to impress the gender biased Episcopal um, late clergy men. Um, this kind of got started because we were aware that she had been a delegate to that 1949 um, convention, which where the women were in which the women were not allowed to be seated and I've included that here and I understand that you have uh, had one uh, program about that so and, and very typical for myself I have way too much material so I'm going to kind of try to um, 
um, edit as I uh, edit as I go. Um, but uh, Elizabeth uh, Davis Pittman is um, born in Council Bluffs, and I'll talk a little bit about that, which is across the river from um, Omaha um, and reared in Omaha. So she faced numerous challenges. This, um, after her, or about the time of her death, um, is a building on the University of, uh, or Creighton University's campus here in Omaha, which was dedicated to her. So it is evidence of her success and um, the fact that, and, and to honor her um, for her education and, and her work in the legal community. Um, on the other hand, this is the article um, that appeared in a newspaper in 1970 when women were finally seated at the general convention. So these are the two bookends really of the career of her career that I wanna talk about. Um, the photograph um, here on the right, on the left is a, the Douglas County attorney um, helping her on with her robes. There are a couple things I wanna, um, I, Douglas County is, and I, because I refer to that, Douglas County is the county in which Omaha sits. So we are in Douglas County. And um, a couple of times in my, in my uh, writing on the slides, I use the abbreviation C and CA, which is just a, a historian shorthand, shorthand for circa, which means about when you don't have a precise date. It's a really useful, really useful tool. So to start with though, um, Elizabeth Davis Pittman did not leave a diary. Um, she did not write an autobiography. So basically what we know about her um, are from a, a few interviews. She, as I say, her whole community and she in her community um, were highly successful, but they didn't lock any boats. So it's really hard there to find any real pithy um, statements from her, even though she is doing this in the mid 1960s, which is the height of Jim Crow and racial activism. But I just, one of the, one of the few stories that exists, I, I want to sort of share with you to start because it, it's a good way to set the stage. Um, on a sunny afternoon in the early 1930s, 10 young girls picnic together in Omaha's Hummel Park, which is um, a, a green space, very rural green space um, north of Omaha. While they played, one of the children, Betty, climbed onto a large rock and commanded the other girls to listen. They were, declared Betty, now in a courtroom where they could try it, where they would try a case. The playmates were all black and Betty appointed two of them to be attorneys, simultaneously announcing that she was the judge. The case proceeded. So it is remarkable, this is the early 1930s, we don't have a precise date, that a young black girl could even dream of becoming um, a lawyer and much less a judge. The first black female judge was not appointed until 1939 in New York City. Uh, Jane M. Bolin was appointed to the city's domestic relations court. So the odds that she would achieve that dream to the extent that she did are really slim and almost none in the 1930s, which makes her story um, even more remarkable. So with that, I'm gonna begin. And um, as I say, she was born, um, and these, are, these are the discussion topics, um, her family background, the African-American community history of, of Omaha, a little bit about that anyway, her legal career, civil rights views, community service, and uh, her role in the Episcopal Church. So we'll start with her family background. Um, she was born in 1921 in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And for those of you that are familiar, unfamiliar with the geography of, of this particular region, but um, Omaha sits on the far eastern side of Nebraska, right along the Missouri River. You cross that river and you are in Iowa. And Iowa became a state in 1946. So the city of Council Bluffs is significantly older than the region around Nebraska, uh, around Omaha. But Omaha was a jumping off point for all of the trails that headed into the West. So consequently, we had um, always from, um, from the very beginning a more vibrant economy. And that 
gave us a more, pro uh, the black community here, a more progressive outlook. The Davises are beginning life over at Council Bluffs. And in all probability, that is one of the reasons that they wanted to leave. So um, Elizabeth Ann Davis's parents are Mabel Hawkins and Charles Franklin Davis. This is a, a photograph of um, Charles Franklin, the only one that I really could find, but he was born and reared in Council Bluffs. So um, that's a smaller mindset, I think, than, than he um, exhibited or that he had. He um, at some point had to have completed an undergraduate degree and I have not been able to ascertain that. But across the river, in Omaha, beginning in 1908, we had a university, Omaha University, and we also had a law school by then. So by the late teens and early 20s, our the Omaha University Law School was admitting African Americans, and he came and attended um, Omaha University Law School from 1925 to 1927. I did not do the research, but someone else uh, tried to get a definitive graduation date. We're unable to do so um, because Omaha University is now part of <clears throat> the Nebraska University system. Couldn't get those dates. Um, but in the summer of 1927, he passed the bar in Nebraska. So whether or not he graduated, doesn't matter. Um, he had passed the Nebraska bar and could be um, a uh, Nebraska lawyer, uh, a lawyer in Nebraska. Um, however, they were still in Council Bluffs in 1927 because he was, had earned a position in the office of the Council Bluffs Street Commissioner. And that's kind of important because this is an era of uh, a lot of Jim Crow rules. Um, most cities of any size, size had a few positions that were set aside for African-Americans. So they were never, um, they, they were never um, even, as uh, with as advanced as their education would normally have allowed. And so in 1927, he is, has finished law school, essentially. He is a clerk in the office of the Council Bluff Street Commissioner. And I don't know that that was the one that they set aside for him, but it, we had several similar ones um, in, in Omaha and the, the, the whis office of, federal office of the whiskey gauger was a position set aside for an African-American um, here in Omaha. And I find that very interesting, but that's probably how he earned that position. He did own his own home. He and his father-in-law, Robert Hawkins, shared ownership over their home in Council Bluffs. Um, now, Mabel Hawkins uh, is the daughter of Robert Hawkins. They, they married at some point early in the 1920s. Um, she too was Council Bluffs born and raised. She, I don't know what her education was, but I do know that she served as a reporter for the AME Church in Council Bluffs for uh, an African-American newspaper here in Omaha. So she clearly had some writing skill and um, ultimately um, when they moved, after they moved over to Iowa or to Omaha, she became the librarian at Kellum School. And so this photograph over here on the left is um, at Kellum School in the Omaha Public School System where she was the librarian at some point. Um, don't have a definition on that either. Um, but I think this photograph um, on the, that just came up on the lower right is, helps explain why Charles Franklin Davis uh, and the Davis family wanted to move to Omaha. So Omaha, one of our major industries throughout our post-Civil War history has been Union Pacific Railroad. And that's spilled over into Council Bluffs. And as you know, um, from Africa, whether you know it academically or just know it from um, cultural understanding, African-Americans never lived in the most affluent parts of the city. So in Council Bluffs, the neighborhood in which most African-Americans lived was pretty close to the railroad, which had a large presence even in Council Bluffs. So there is no bridge between Omaha and Council Bluffs until 1873. But there was a large rail industry there. And um, he, we do know that uh, Charles Franklin Davis worked for a while 
for the Griffin Wheel Company, which was a company that produced a wheel that was a cooler when it functioned on the, on the trains than had been previously used. So that was one of his, one of his early jobs. This photograph um, is taken of a business in the vicinity of the neighborhood where most African-Americans live. And if you look closely at it, you can see, I think there are a couple of African-Americans here who are livery attendants. So clearly Joseph or uh, uh, Charles Franklin Davis had aspirations that were not gonna be met in Council Bluffs. And so um, in late in 1927, the family moved across the river to Omaha where they lived for the rest of their lives. Um, and Davis is, was reported in the newspaper that summer to have been hired as Omaha's first Negro lawyer. So very aspirational family, um, very education oriented family um, in, in that uh, window of time. So uh, we'll turn to the African-American community history and just a, a, a tiny bit um, of territorial stuff. This is a map of the United States in 1854. And the area in purple is the um, Kansas and Nebraska territory. The Kansas territory to the south actually became Kansas in 1861. The territory to the north, much larger, um, still occupied by Native Americans primarily in 1854. Very, very few African Americans in that northern part. In the southern part, they tried to stuff it, if you remember from your history, with African Americans because they wanted Kansas um, to become a slave state when uh, at statehood. Um, and they figured Nebraska territory would not. So they kind of left that, that region alone. The little red dot on here um, is the approximate location of Omaha and Council Bluffs, which sit right on the Missouri River, on either side of the Missouri River. So they took census um, in 1854, 55, and then again in 1860. And in 54 and 55, all of the African-Americans, all of 13 and then 11 who lived in our territory were registered as slaves. And that takes a little explanation I wanna, because we were not supposed to be slave oriented. 1860, through that entire region, there are only 72 blacks, 11 of whom were slaves. By 1870, Omaha had a population of about, of over 16,000 people but there are still less than 500 African-Americans living in Omaha. The reason that there are so many slaves or what looks like a disproportionate number of blacks who are not free, let me put it that way, uh, in 54, 55 and 60 was that our territorial constitution acknowledged that individuals who came to settle in Nebraska or Nebraska territory, their property rights would be protected. So what if they brought 10 cows and a wagon and six slaves, we would allow them to hang on to their property and we would protect it. That lasts until 1860. And in 1860, the Nebraska Territorial Legislature voted to outlaw slavery. So that 11 slaves recorded on the 1860 census are the, the last ones um, recorded here because no, well, there is no chattel property, even though slaves have not yet been freed. So that's just uh, the Nebraska territory um, story. Another piece that it, as we talk about any of this, it's kind of important to remember and you, I'm sure you had it at some point in your history is that Omaha is the Eastern terminus of the Transcontinental Railroad, which was built in, right after the Civil War, so began after the Civil War when labor was available again in the summer of 1865, completed in um, where they joined the Central Pacific on May 10, 1869. So because every nail and rail and piece of wood that was used on, in building that railroad had to be, had to come out of Omaha, came up river first, had to come out of Omaha. Um, they're essentially in the early days of building the railroad in from Omaha, it took 40 wagon loads. This is wagons that are pulled by eight uh, teams of oxen, oxen, 
40 wagon loads of materials to build one mile of track. And the, the, the track was laid at a very slow pace, but you can imagine the employment opportunities that that brought to Omaha. So that after the Civil War, soldiers, anyone who participated in the Civil War and African-Americans came into the city and that was a, um, a very um, logical job for them. So not, it's not a, a tremendous amount of um, African-Americans even then, but there were certainly some. So the rail construction camps is kind of behind our windows. There is um, a barber photo um, behind them as well. So some of those early African-Americans were barbers. Um, some of them were porters and many servile occupations. So they came, they were waiters and they were um, livery people. And, um, but um, the Pullman car comes a little bit later, but the Pullman porter was a notch above the regular porter. But um, those were jobs readily available to blacks. We graded down our streets. So there's about a half a mile of Omaha um, in uh, streets that amount to about a half a mile that were lowered or, or actually manually graded down between 1873 and 1920, as many as uh, five times. Some of those streets were graded five times that, and some of them as much as 50 feet. So that a, a, was a wonderful um, uh, labor intensive um, occupation that African-Americans um, were, were free to participate in, so. But by the 1880s, lots of professionals. There are policemen. Uh, Silas Robbins is the first African-American lawyer and he um, received his um, education in the University of Mississippi and then uh, passed the bar in Nebraska. So he is our first, the first African-American lawyer in Nebraska. Dan Desdunes, um, lots of musicians come to Omaha. Dan Desdunes became the band uh, leader for um, Flanagan, Father Flanagan's Boys Town. And whether or not you live here, you're familiar with Boys Town over the years, but Dan Desdunes was the um, boys uh, band leader. Um, Matthew Ricketts earned his undergraduate degree in Missouri and Omaha very briefly in the 18, uh, 70s had a, um, a medical school and he spent three years in that medical school and became uh, one of our first physicians, but also a state legislator during the reconstruction period. And then we had uh, a lot of clergymen. This is John Albert Williams, who was the rector of St. Philip the Deacon Episcopal Church where Elizabeth's um, family attended. And just uh, real quickly, I, it, it, Omaha, I'm trying to focus on the city that Davis would have, the Davises moved into. But <clears throat> even by the turn of the century, Omaha had a professional building, business building in, the, in our commercial, in the commercial sector, center of the commercial sector for African-Americans in downtown Omaha. So this was the, called the Friends of Rock and the African-Americans had their offices there. We had an, there was a, a, a um, African-American uh, architect and he's here early in the century. He designed houses and in this case um, on the right, on the left uh, uh, kind of an apartment duplex kind of structure. There were eight theaters between the 1930s and the 19, uh, by the time you get to the late 1920s and the 1930s, um, multiple social clubs. This is a phenomenal piece of Omaha's African-American history, the Jewell Building. So <clears throat> um, James Jewell was a, had opened a billiards hall in the African-American community in Omaha very early in the century. And in 1923, his wife um, was quite a musician, had a very fine voice. And he was uh, irritated because the there were very fine black, uh, black bands and um, theater groups who came to Omaha, but they were very sporadically um, hired by the local theaters. And he wanted a theater in the African-American community so that African-Americans could go and listen to the music and see the um, 
um, plays and reviews, etc. So <clears throat> he built a new building. This is a brick building, still stands, um, known as the Dreamland Ballroom. On the ground floor, those two uh, plate glass windows on the lower floor, one was a beauty shop, uh, or a beauty supply shop, the other was a barber shop. But the second floor was known as the Dreamland Ballroom. And this is where musicians throughout the jazz era appeared in Omaha. And so just a, you know, a list of some of the individuals that we know appeared there or that are easy to, um, um, to, that you would remember. Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Nat King Cole, um, Count Basie. What you see this, this photograph down in front is the Nat Tolls, uh, Towels Orchestra. Um, they had their own bus because if you remember, African Americans couldn't stay in, in, in regular hotels. So they had their own bus for lodging. And then the photograph that's over here on the right, kind of under our images, um, is uh, Count Basie's orchestra. But this was a, a regionally known, very fine uh, ballroom. This is a piece, if you, any of you are doing sacred ground or if you are interested in um, the African-American Black Protestant churches, um, I think a very interesting piece. And, and um, African-Americans obviously um, had their own religions when they came. They didn't even, they couldn't even understand each other. So they had to learn English and they learned it from uh, primarily from Anglicans. Um, so it's no wonder that we have uh, such an interesting dialect um, in the uh, in the South. But they they um, had to develop their own understanding of Christianity and what they heard um, in the, the Puritan forms of worship from any slave owners that allowed them to read taught them to read the Bible was the um, stories of the Hebrews and their enslavement. Um, the Israelites, and they, they came to insert themselves in those stories, and they saw for themselves um, an end to this. They, they perceived that there would be an end um, to their slavery. And the quote that's under here, on, up on the top of your screen, is his plan for them was clear, which is a quote by W.E.B. Du Bois. And that was their, their feeling. God's plan for them was clear. He was going to lift that yoke of slavery. They were not going to be chattel people. They were going to be free. But when that happened, it happened overnight. And I don't think we really ever internalize the idea that they went to bed as chattel property and they woke up as free men, not equal, but free. And so there is, a, I forgot to bring it down, I was gonna bring it down for you, um, a, a book, a fairly recent monograph called um, The End of Dates, in which a young man from, I believe it's North, North uh, Carolina University has um, put together, uh, has written the story of that transition for African-Americans and their arrival at the black Protestant churches. But for them, the church became their, uh, uh, their institution of learning because they didn't know how to be free. You know, they're, they're, none of them had been free. 250 years, they had been here as chattel property and overnight they become free. And I don't think we really think about the, the change in behaviors and um, mental um, situations that that, that, that uh, brought. So the churches become very central to the African-American community. And they're the first, um, the first African-American um, priest had been ordained in, I wanna say, I, I, it's, a, it's the Diocese of Pennsylvania, which was then all of one. In about 1797, does that sound right from you guys' history? I believe that's right. The, then the AME church, the African American Methodist church derives in, in the very early 19th century. So there are those two um, institutions, but um, the AME church did not spread into Nebraska until we find it in Omaha in 1867. And this 
tiny photograph is, it was a little tiny frame church, but it is the first African-American church in the African-American community in Omaha. Um, and it still exists in Omaha. This is just the, its very first building. Um, this is St. Philip the Deacon Episcopal Church, which is the one that um, Elizabeth and her family attended after they moved to Omaha. So they had obviously been members of the AME Church in Council Bluffs. But St. Philip the Deacon Episcopal Church is central to our community. It is the place where you thumb your nose, at, um, in so many words, at Jim Crow. Um, they, they were equal and they made sure their community was equal in every way to the white community around them. Um, but Philip the Deacon had been founded as a school um, in Omaha in 1877. This building was completed in 1893. And this is the Zion Baptist Church. These are the three earliest African-American churches in the African-American community founded in this one in 1884. And this is a, um, um, building designed by the African-American architect who was here. But the, another reason that the Davises would have moved here, that the uh, community was so strong in Omaha, was there were several at what they then called Afro-American newspapers. So there are 1891, very few um, examples of it left, but the, uh, the pro called the Progress, Another one called the Omaha, um, it's not the star, the Omaha, I can't, this isn't, I can't read it. But in any case, that, that's printed here in Omaha. And then the Monitor. And the Monitor was edited and produced weekly by um, Reverend John Albert Williams, who was the editor or the rector of the um, St. Philip Deacon Episcopal Church. So uh, they had, they're full of white news from around the globe actually, but that gave them all, gave them a place where they could write about their own events. They could advertise their own gatherings. They could um, tout their own, their own people as that, and that's what the progress does here. These are all very prominent um, African-Americans in Omaha in 1890, and there are a little bit of bios on all of them. Just a little bit about Philip the Deacon. Um, it was initiated, as I say, in 1877 in the saloon of this old hotel, which is uh, up here on the upper right-hand corner. Um, that building had been built in 1867. It never really, it was a very, supposed to be built as a luxury hotel, never really achieved that kind of success, but became kind of a rooming house um, for a lot of business people, especially African-Americans. And um, uh, Dean, the Dean of Trinity Cathedral was a man named Dean Milspa. And he approached the owners in 1877 and asked if he could use the saloon, the saloon in the building, which obviously was not being used as a school for African-American children. So it began there. Um, and it was right in the downtown in the central part of, of Omaha. It began as a school in 1877. And uh, one of the articles that I, <clears throat> that, was, that I just finished or appeared this summer <clears throat> was a, an article about um, St. Augustine's Episcopal Church down in Nebraska City. But it began as a school and then morphed into a church. So this begins as a school and um, morphed into a church as well. Um, it stayed that way for several years. They, they met, I believe, in the Masonic Hall once they started having services. <clears throat> and um, in 1882, they were in the process of building our current cathedral. And we were then housed in this little frame building. And as once there was enough space in the current under construction cathedral um, to hold services, Dean Millspa asked if we could move the old building, our old cathedral building to a new site to be used as a, a church. And it became Philip the Deacon at that time. Until then they were calling it Trinity, Old Trinity Mission, but in 1882 it became um, Philip the Deacon Episcopal Church. This is the church that was, so it was a decade in that little building. And then in um, 18, 
93, they moved the church back to, to the back of the lot and built this lovely stone structure, um, which existed, remained in use until 1949. And then they built yet another um, building, but all of that was, is no longer exists. St. Philip the Deacon listed, existed well into the 1970s, but was then um, incorporated into another church, uh, another Episcopal church in that region. So St. Philip the Deacon doesn't um, exist at all anymore. It has a tremendous history in Omaha, however. Um, this is Reverend John Albert Williams and his family. And he had, he was, he's from Ontario and um, went to seminary um, up in Wisconsin, came down to Omaha in 1891. He was not yet married. And um, sometime early in the century, in the 20th century, he married Lucy Gamble, who is the woman here on his right in this photograph. She was a teacher um, in the Omaha public schools. There were two African-American teachers. And obviously when she got married, she couldn't no longer be a teacher. Um, and the other female who was teaching also left at that time. So from 1905 until 1937, there was not a single African-American teacher in the Omaha public schools. So in, by 1890, Omaha has a population, probably they feel like it's inflated, but we'll just say 1900. A, a population of 100,000 people. And there are no African-American teachers in, in our school district. Um, this is the monitor. This is uh, one, of the, one of the first issues that John um, Albert Williams uh, put out. But it is, um, again, he clearly, he says, he says to all of his readers, we are equal to anything that is happening in the white commun community. And in this particular one, he said, you know, there are 8,000, roughly 8,000 blacks here in Omaha. Most of them own their own homes. And then he went on to summarize the occupations and businesses. And I, it, I'll, I just want to read, read through it very fast, but it, it's really interesting. Six physicians, two dentists, three pharmacists, five lawyers, three stenographers, three real estate firms, two ho uh, three hotels, two undertakers, two well-stocked, drug stores, a bakery, dressmakers, milliners, barbers, and tailors, grocery stores, ice and vendor. Sorry, I meant to shut that darn thing off. Um, vendors, uh, ice vendors and coal vendors, uh, restaurants, billiard halls, and taxi drivers. So, you know, we, we are the same as you. And John Albert Williams wrote that multiple times in, 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 as an editorial. And to that end, this is one of the more interesting pieces of the black history in Omaha that the Davises are part, clearly very much part of. So in May of 1930, um, St. Philip the Deacon began a coronation ball, an annual coronation ball, which they held in May of every year. And they held it in that dreamland ballroom. Um, and every year they would um, crown one of their prominent African-American men or businessmen, uh, King Aurora, and the daughter <clears throat> of one of their prominent families, Queen Borealis. And uh, the, the queen and the king were not announced until the night of the ball. Um, so before the ball, there were 30 prominent young African-American women who were princesses uh, that came out of the, the Omaha community. Six countesses were prominent young women from surrounding towns. And then the night of the coronation, the king and queen were um, announced. This, so this photograph that you're looking at is the, the um, one, it, it, it was undated. It's one of the later coronation balls which occurred at Dreamland Ballroom. Well, there's a little bit of backstory here because the, in 1895, Omaha, the Omaha uh, uh, business community had first created an organization called Exarban, which is Nebraska spelled backwards. And it was kind of the end of the 1895 um, drought and financial calamity. So that was what they were honoring. They were bringing us out of that. And they decided at, that they would annually 
in their, they would have their coronation ball and parade in September, or October. <clears throat> so in the fall of every year, um, that they would honor a prominent businessman, man who would be the king of Sarban, a prominent, the young a young woman from a prominent family um, in, the, in the business community would be the queen. And there were a number, and there, I don't remember how many princesses, but we still do this. This is still an Omaha tradition. And the local young women are called princesses. And one of them is announced at the coronation and ball to, as the queen. And countesses come from all over Nebraska and Iowa, from the cities in Nebraska and Iowa. So we were doing it in the white community from 1895 on. And they decided in 1930, they were gonna do it too. And this lasts, as I say, well into the 1950s and we're still doing the Exarban coronation and ball. Here's the real upshot. In 1939, the king of Exarban came to the St. Philip's coronation ball to honor the African-American King Borealis. And I, I just think that's such a statement about our African-American community, and while they were dumbed down, they had a ceiling, it was clear that they had a, a tremendous amount of respect um, from the local white community. So, um, so turn, going on here to uh, Elizabeth Pittman's uh, legal career, she, the, I, ta I read you the story of her, uh, picnic of her friends picnicking in Hummel Park where she called herself a judge. Um, in the 30s, she worked in her father's uh, law firm um, in, in, in the summertime and she worked on the school newspaper. Um, she was employed as a clerk, of the, uh, as a stenographer in the clerk of the district court in the summer of 1937. And the photograph up here in the upper right was uh, appeared in the local newspaper um, she graduated from Omaha North High School. She was awarded a scholarship to the University of Nebraska uh, where she studied political science, for, but for just for two, two years. Um, she, in 1942, she married um, Dr. Arthur ba Basil Pittman, another very well-known African-American family. Um, he had, was um, a doctor of veterinary medicine, which he had earned at Iowa State <clears throat> University. In 1947, they had a daughter named um, Tony or Antoinette. Um, in 19, sometime, probably about 1945, she went back to school and this time to Creighton University. And she had to finish her undergrad there. And then she entered their law school. And um, after two years, she finished that program. But when she took her oath of office, uh, after finishing the bar exam in September of 40, 1948, she was among the earliest black women, not the first, but among the earliest to, in Nebraska to pass um, the bar exam. And in 1950, she was the only black female attorney in the state. And there were then only 39 black female attorneys in the United States. In 48 then, she and her father uh, established a private law firm, which they called Davis and Pittman, which was one of the first I want few such firms on record. And her, her father died in 1959. Um, but after his death, she continued to maintain that firm by herself. And in 1964, she called her firm a family practice with clients from birth to maturity. In 1964, there was a vacancy in the, in, amongst the Douglas County attorney staff. Um, the assistant attorney had been promoted to something else. And so they appointed Elizabeth, the deputy Douglas County attorney. So she was the first female and the first black in that role. Um, they, when they did it, they did it partly because most of the, the Douglas County attorney is an elected position. However, it was easier to break that ceiling for an African-American by using a position where she could be appointed. So the, the fact that, that this position opened up and they could appoint her um, worked very well for the African-American community. Um, in 19, 
uh, 71, she applied for, there was a vacancy in the municipal court system. She applied for that role. And this was one she had to apply for as did a whole bunch of other lawyers. Um, she was appointed by Nebraska Governor J. James Exon. And um, when she was sworn into office on April 8th, 1971. And just, you know, having listened to the, all the hoopla last week with um, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's hearings, this just, it, I just find it very moving um, because all the newspaper said was that over 300 people, half of them blacks, crowded into the office when she, into the chamber when she took her oath of office. That, that's true, but I, the, the fact that over half of them were Blacks and just listening to the individuals last week um, speak to the fact that Katanji Brown Jackson was now going to represent them, people of color, perhaps, I hope, I, I haven't heard the latest, but on the United States Supreme Court just very moving. And I have to sort of think about how that must have felt to all of the African-Americans in Omaha who crowded into that chamber um, to see her uh, take her oath of office. And um, Cory Booker made a, a very impassioned sort of um, uh, statement about how she has persevered in, in, in those hearings. And he said, you know, when I was elected and I ended up walking through the offices here, um, I, he was like, he's a Senator. I walked through the chamber offices and it was late one night and here's an African-American uh, who is a janitor. Um, he said, that could have been me. And he said he, he was so grateful, so glad to see me, so glad to see my face, someone of my color, in these halls as a professional. I think um, it, it, this is far more momentous than the words in the Omaha World Herald's um, reporting of it. So anyway, so 71, she was a woman of the year. Um, 73, Creighton awards her an honorary doctorate. In 1985, she became a Douglas County judge, partly because they merged the municipal court systems of Omaha and Lincoln. Lincoln is our capital city. It's about 50 miles west of us. So when they merged those two court systems, she became um, a Douglas County judge. So it, again, elevated um, her stature one more level. She resigned, or excuse me, retired in 1986 and went to work in um, the county attorney's office. She died early in 1998. I'll talk a little bit about more about that uh, at the end here. But um, in 1998, um, they dedicated that building that I showed you early on on Creighton campus to her. And since the middle 2010s, they have um, awarded a, um, a, an Elizabeth Pittman Award by the um, Black students at Creighton University has been awarded to one of their, one of their own colleagues. Um, her civil rights views, you know, um, and I'm going way over, darn it, and discuss it with myself here. So up here above this, it says, uh, she says basically freedom is indivisible. You can't have some people have these rights and some have not. And she really never made a lot of particularly pithy um, statements about civil rights, but she is um, taking these roles in the middle of the civil rights movement one of the things which agitated her was the fact that her neighborhood was redlined. There, you, the within there, they had the the um, lenders and the um, real estate agents had decided that they needed to keep African Americans north of a particular street and south of a particular street in Omaha, and that neighborhood has come to simply be called North Omaha and between two north and south streets, 10 blocks apart. And you couldn't sell, if you lived outside of that area, you couldn't sell your home to a, a black person. A black person was not supposed to sell their home to a white person. It wasn't as though these were written in stone anywhere, but this was, these were the Jim Crow laws with which they lived. 
And so this is 1964 that these still exist. What she says basically is that if they would pass legislation to make that illegal, it would it would uh, reduce the problem because a, a, a bucking that system was scary um, for some whites that might otherwise do so. And the, the Fair Housing Law does not pass till 1968. Equality, aren't all human beings the same? You know, if we, if we put ourselves in other people's shoes, it's easier to live and understand them. Um, there are many kinds of people. Each individual has his own unique contribution to make. And about North Omaha, she says there's been so much segregation, so many people have left town. It's going to take years to bring, to invite Africans to come back in, African Americans to come back into Omaha. Um, partly, or not partly, but because of, she never says anything negative about this. But in 1944, her father and several other African American businessmen had opened what's called the Carver Savings and Loan Association. And it's up there in North Omaha. It is because African Americans couldn't get loans. They were the the um, the uh, rates were higher. The criteria for getting obtaining those loans was higher, was unmanageable or unattainable by many African Americans. And so they got a they got a charter from the state of Nebraska, and they opened what was called the Carver Savings and Loan Association. Um, it existed until 1985. Even after her father's death, she continued to um, uh, man, be on the board of directors and serve as the institution's um, secretary treasurer. I just want to show you just real briefly the map. So this is a map of the 1920s Omaha, which is when they are arriving in Omaha. And I've, I've identified on the large map over here, the yellow is our, basically our corridor. The blue area is basically what was occupied by railroad stations, round table, round station, round um, um, what were they repaired trains, a lot of train tracks, 23, 23 train tracks in Omaha um, in the 1920s. Um, and the green was our stockyard area. So the rest of us basically residential and it doesn't matter whether you are Swedish or Greek or uh, German or Irish, they had their own little neighborhoods. The African-Americans lived in what is basically that red square on that map. So this is the area that was set aside by real estate agents and by lenders as the area where Omahans could live. And they had to live north of this area, south of and between those two streets. The red spots are basically the, those three churches that I talked about. There are others. But these are those, uh, that's the location of those three main churches. The blue triangle is where Elizabeth Pittman lived. So she lived in her own neighborhood. But now I want to show you something that's really um, uh, upsetting. And I'm sure you'll find the same thing if you look in your own African American community. So in 1959, the uh, Interstate 80 went through Omaha, and it's to the south, kind of at the bottom of your screen, was where Interstate 80 was built. And over the years, they built, you know, uh, uh, other lines um, to attach to the interstate system. And there's one way to the west. In the beginning in the 1970s, they built one to go straight north in Omaha. And look where it went. Right through the middle of the African-American neighborhood. Has torn it up. Took three, three, three blocks of African-American housing completely out of commission broke up the African-American neighborhood. And this little uh, purple dot, that was, they put a building across that intersection so that blacks um, could not travel north down into, into the downtown area. So, you know, we're still reckoning with that. That's still uh, that way, as I say, Fair Housing Act, um, 18, 1968, and then the 1970s kind of ended some of those restrictions, but um, they're still, um, it's very interesting to travel that route to see it very clearly. Um, community service, I'm gonna go through this very quickly because she, she was, was a major hobby. She um, was a, on the council of PTA. She was the first black person elected to the Omaha Board of Education by a sizable margin in November of 1950. And she resigned a year later um, 
there were minor newspaper reports that said she was exhausted, that it was a medical reason that she had resigned. Um, that's, that came up a couple of times, but she was clearly a pretty busy person. She's an NAACP, Women's Lawyers Guild, League of Women Voters, Omaha Legal Aid Society, um, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, YWCA Board of Directors. She, in 1960, she served as a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. She was elected president of the National Federation of Settlement, uh, Settlements and Neighborhood Centers um, and continued to serve on its executive committee after that. Um, these remarks that she makes on feminism in the 18, in the 1970s are kind of interesting. Um, you, you know, when contemporary women need to let the world know what they really want to do. Um, they have a need for self-fulfillment, which begins when they respect themselves and what they are doing. And women have to accept other people as they are. And then on freedom and feminism, she says, again, freedom's a right, not a privilege. And this, I, I love these, this statement, women are finished being serving and people should stop saying that being a woman means to walk on hallowed ground. And if she plays her cards right, canonization is just around the corner. And then she goes on to say, parents should not train their children, their, their daughters to make a better lemon meringue pie. And that the equality of women and boys uh, in the eyes of boys and girls starts at a young age. It's just a, a, a wonderful statement. And then um, she was not in favor of the death penalty, um, but that probation and rehabilitation were important. So the, the church, and I'm just, these are some pictures that with, with which you all have got to be a, um, um, familiar. Women have always been on the altar deal. We work in the kitchen. This is a group of women um, who are cleaning the church, which we've all done. This is a Sunday school. This happens to be on the Winnebago reservation, but women were Sunday school teachers. This is women were allowed to sing in the choir, but not until late in the 19th century. This is all Saints Episcopal Church in Omaha. And it was such a phenomenon that a newspaper from Boston came out to, to interview and take pictures of the women. Um, this is the interior of Trinity Cathedral in um, uh, probably in the 1870s, but we were always capable of decorating. And we had a deaconess um, in, eight, in um, uh, 1873, whoops. And um, I love this picture, this last one. Uh, we always, we would have little booths at places during money, a vestry. And I just love the cross section of humanity and gender um, in that photograph. So that's our traditional roles. Um, Robert Harper Clarkson was a, a, a very progressive bishop. So, you know, we had a, a, a deacon, um, he listened to his wife and I think we, she didn't keep a diary, but I think we forget that there was a lot of um, um, exchange of conversation between them. So Meliora Clarkson was, uh, had organized a soup kitchen, a hospital, a sanitary fair, all in Chicago before they came to Omaha in 1865. An art fair in 1879 to help build the cathedral, they earned $1,000. That's like $23,000 today in 1879. Elizabeth Butterfield Woolworth um, was a wife of a, a, one of our principal, uh, she came as principal of Brownell Hall, but one of our primary um, lay people. And, Dr. George Worthington, who was the director after or our bishop after um, Clarkson died, didn't want anything to do with women. So our deaconess program ended and women were only, were never invited to meetings where there was going to be some talk of something, some money um, to be spent. Because he did that partly that we, and he didn't like the Eastern part, Western part of the state, so we cut that off. Um, we put a, created a missionary district out there, but um, Bishop Rogers, uh, Bishop Anson Rogers Graves at his first annual convention said, women need to participate fully in the work we do. They should be on parish vestries, they should hold parish positions, they should vote in parish elections. So that's 1890 on either end of the state. You see a, a <clears throat> real 180 degrees. And then of course, um, Elizabeth who served on the vestry, um, and Philip the deacon from probably 1954 onward. I couldn't get a precise date, but that's probably when she first served on the vestry. And it was that role 
and that took her um, as the um, delegate to the 1949 um, General Convention. Their, their arguments to start this went back to 1919 when um, they decided that um, they wouldn't change the word layman to communicant and uh, women could not sit on the floor of the, the House of Deputies uh, with the men. So they could come to the convention, but they couldn't sit there. Um, then uh, in, in 1949, uh, Mrs. Randolph Dyer, her name is Betsy, um, was kind of groomed by the Diocese of, Miss, of Missouri to serve as a delegate, the, um, the archdeacon and the Bishop of Missouri, whose name was uh, Bishop Scarlett, believed that women's voices needed to be heard at the, annual, at the general convention. And so they well, kind of went through their parish rosters and decided that Betsy Dyer was a good choice. Her uh, Randolph Dyer was a descendant of Auguste Chouteau, who was a very well-known fur trader um, and had founded St. Louis. So they had that base covered with her. Um, she was a Huntington. So her grandfather was Frederick Dan Huntington, who had been the first Bishop of New York. Her um, uncle is, I can never remember the guy's name here. Uh, John Otis Sargent Huntington was Frederick Dan's son. Uh, he founded the Order of the Cross. So he's very Anglo-Catholic. So she would cover that base. And they submitted her name and she went to the general convention which was in Philadelphia that year and the, one of those first few days they um, approved their delegates um, honorable Augustus Hand who was a, a district court judge from New York was asked there, there was some controversy about her presence but he was asked and he said layman is a word that you is used to mean it's all inclusive it's used to mean all laity and he's called it preposterous, <laughs> preposterous to limit the meaning of layman as to exclude women. So she, she was at the convention. She participated in those decisions um, when, that Missouri participated in. Um, but later in the general convention, it came up again. So there was first a resolution that just sought to clarify the meaning of the word layman and they decided that layman has always meant men. Why should that change? And it was voted down. But in the same breath, they uh, wrote another resolution which was not ever voted on, um, but it was a pr proposal to change the word layman to um, um, not, they had tried communicant um, person, lay, uh, to lay person, because that could mean either gender. So that one was not voted on in 49. Everybody goes home. The Dyers left Missouri in, uh, as 1949 approached four states, including Nebraska, voted to send females to the general convention. Um, Puerto Rico was unable to make the trip. So there were only three there. But the, the resolution, which had not been voted on in 46, was voted on early in the uh, process in 49 and they voted against it. So the three women who had gone as delegates for their states were not permitted or their dioceses were not permitted to um, attend. And I, this is just kind of a hoot, I think. This is the headline that appeared in the Omaha World Herald. Omaha loses out <laughs> at church convention. So it was, she, um, Elizabeth was, went as a, an Episcopalian. She was not rejected on the basis of her race. She was rejected on the basis of her gender. So, um, and women are, are not finally seated until 1970. So just real quickly um, to determine to end all of this, uh, just a reminder really that Elizabeth Ann Davis um, Pittman um, and, and her community had multiple challenges. They had to defy Jim Crow. Um, she had a dream to become a lawyer. She had to defy Jim Crow her personally um, to attain that. And she had to live into her community responsibilities because that's how you elevated your community stature, um, at least up to the level that Jim Crow was, uh, would permit you 
Um, and so each of those community responsibilities that she took on was partly for that reason. She and um, Dr. Pittman separated, divorced in 1957. And in fact, Tony was raised by her father. So, and, and there were a couple of uh, hospitalizations for her. Um, it would, you know, just reading between the lines, it would seem that she was extremely busy and um, to the detriment perhaps of her health. And I, I did find another article, she and her daughter were very close, but it must have been easier um, for her father uh, to raise her. Um, so Elizabeth Ann Davis Pittman is a product of her family, uh, her African-American, her, uh, um, her progressive father who sought more than what he had her progressive community and her church. And, and for her, that was the Episcopal Church. Um, she died in April of 1998, was buried from Trinity Cathedral. But just to, and I'm sure there are more, I found an obituary for her in each of these newspapers, not just in Omaha and the Nebraska, and Lincoln and uh, Des Moines newspapers. These are the other newspapers around the country that printed an obituary of Elizabeth Pittman when she died in 1998. It wasn't always necessarily very long, but her, what she had done um, in defying Jim Crow and getting her education and um, um, attaining um, the, the, her own personal goals um, really set, the, set a, a bar for the individuals to come after her. And honestly, um, I think it was probably extremely difficult for those African-American women, uh, African-Americans in general in that period of time. So, sorry, I wanted to, I wanted to take questions. I don't know if you wanna keep it going or. Thank you so much, Joe, for this wonderful presentation. Yes, indeed, we have gone over our time. Um, if you do have questions, I'm going to ask Joe if she could uh, get uh, get these questions and 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 uh, get a hold of the person who asked yeah, them absolutely. and answer them personally. Sure. We appreciate you. We ask that you join us next week for our last one, which is with Nan Pete presenting uh, Barbara Harris, and I know that will be an exciting adventure. So. Uh, Good night, and, and I hope that you are having a wonderful Lent. Our prayers are with you, and please keep us all in yours. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>